praise him by singing to God be the glory. Welcome again this morning and uh, welcome those who are watching online, especially my folks over in Indiana. I think they're on this morning, I hope, and some other friends of mine. Anyway, as we jump in this morning, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51. Uh, allow me to pray once more. Father, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Grant us insight and wisdom to your word, that through it we would honor you. In Christ's name, amen. As I was working through Jeremiah 50 and 51, today's topic is the justice of God. Um, I kind of went down a rabbit hole of justice in the world in which we live and what that looks like, how that works, and, and I was uh, transported back into a time when I was in high school a long time ago. Um, and I was in high school, I specialized in things like PE, uh, uh, shop class, ag, um, I don't know what else. It, that was about the limit of my interests. Um, but I had a shop teacher that was uh, pretty much happy if we found something to do and stayed out of his hair. And so, I had a fixation with knives back in the day, maybe it because uh, when I was a kid, we would go up and down the fields, the bean fields, the corn fields, and instead of a hoe, they would give us like a 10-inch butcher knife so we didn't chop out weeds. And so I had had a knife in my hand a long time. So I would make knives, literally, in school. 
So, and the teacher didn't really care. So I'm grinding away, making knives. And at the end of the, the school year, I had made like this three foot broadsword on the milling machine. Nothing like carrying one of those on the school bus to get everybody's attention, right? Well, my skills were not highly developed, okay? I was just killing time, playing with the milling machine. And it was, it was, it was a wretched piece of work, you know? It was, nothing was straight, and it was what it was, and it was kind of cool because it was big, and it was a sword. And, and, I'm, and I'm walking to the school bus, or I was, maybe I was driving back then, I don't remember. But I'm walking out. I remember it's the last day of school, and the teacher's like, get your junk out of the, out of the shop, you know, because I can't. And so I'm carrying a big old sword out to school, right? And another of the students in my grade comes over. I remember his name because it's seared in my memory. And he comes over and he says, I'll give you $5 for that sword. And I'm like, that's a deal because it was junk, right? So I hand him this sword and he says, thanks. And he walked off. And I'm standing there with no five bucks. And he was bigger than I was, and he had a sword. You know, it was like, <laughs> what, what am I going to do with that now, right? You know, it's like, he, he, you know, he'd whoop me if he didn't have a sword. I'm afraid what he might do otherwise. And so I went away steamed, you know. He, he ripped me off of a sword. I didn't really want it, but it was still mine, right? And we had had a deal, and that was unjust, and I've never forgotten. And I would call out his name, but he's probably still alive somewhere, and I don't want to. I want to let it go. I really do. <laughs> I'm working on letting it go. <clears throat> and that's a little teeny injustice, and I can't forget it. And I started looking around, and we live in a world filled with injustices of so many sorts and types and kinds that it's hard to put your finger on what it means and how it works and how does God work in all of this. Life is not fair on so many levels. It's just not. Um, not all of us get the same amount of health and length of life and certain blessings. We just don't get them. Not everybody gets to be born in the United States of America and have the stuff that we have. And you can't put a finger on the hows and whys. But what I'm finding in recent days is that we in our culture are being perpetually offended by something or another, right? We're all getting the raw end of some sort of a deal, and we don't like it very much. I remember sitting in an office in Milwaukee. I worked with uh, mostly ex-cons, and there was a guy. He wasn't part of my crew, but he was, um, he was active in the city, and he was working on prisoner rights, if you will, those who are incarcerated. Um, and he had just stepped out of 17 and a half years in prison for a homicide. And about 10 of those years, he was, he's a really sharp guy. <clears throat> he started writing a newsletter on, you know, how bad prison is and how they ought to up their game so prison would be more fun or less, less unjust. You know, we come in here and it's, we just, we can't get to the telephone or we can't get this. And, it, and so his newsletter caught on because everybody was being ripped off in prison of all the things that they deserved while they were in prison. And it grew and grew until it became, he was putting out like 15,000 letters a month because they were all feeling like they had been ripped off and not getting good prison stuff. I, I couldn't understand it. But it wasn't fair. And they were demanding their rights as prisoners. And I'm like, and he sat down and he's trying to convince me that somehow this is about, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. What is justice? You want justice for these men and women in prison? I get that. But what is justice? And how do you determine what just is? What is justice? And when is it satisfied? If somebody offends you, when are you satisfied with 
the justice that is due you. If somebody takes your sword and runs away with it and doesn't pay you, when am I satisfied? Well, when I get my five bucks plus interest, and it's been a while, right? So it's probably six or seven dollars worth right now. But the issue is, what is justice? And I asked him that question. When is justice satisfied? What is equal, <clears throat> excuse me, to the sword? <clears throat> and I knew where he had just come from. I knew what his crime was. And I said, what is justice for taking the life of another human being? Is 17 years in prison enough to pay for the life you took? I mean, I'm, I wasn't subtle. I mean, I wasn't afraid of him. Did 17 years pay for that? Would 17 years pay for the death of your son? No, 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 no. And suddenly we had a real conversation about justice. How do we determine what is just and unjust? In Jeremiah chapter 50, we're going to get an idea about the justice of God in a very unique situation. To this point in Jeremiah, uh, God said, Jeremiah, you're my man to these nations. You get to tell all the nations my message to them. And he's pronouncing particularly judgment upon um, Judah in the south. Israel in the north had been gone off to the Assyrian captivity. And Judah is right in the last, uh, last pieces before they go off into the Babylonian captivity. And God said, you're going to get it. Go, just go and surrender to Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and go and you can live. But if you stick around and you fight it out, I'm going to, I'm just, it's going to be scorched earth. I'm going to have you killed and we're going to destroy the spot. And that's where they found themselves. And right at the very end, and just before they go off into the last captivity, through the prophet, God promises justice for his people. Against Babylon. And I'm like wait a second. Didn't he just take Nebuchadnezzar and say you're my guy. Go and bring these people into captivity. And the answer is yes he did. And I started to wonder about that. As, the, as these uh, the prisoners of Judah were being chained up. Brutally I'm convinced. And walked hundreds of miles. In chains. To Babylon. In some cases. Just for spite, they would take and put a hook through the nose of the leaders like they would an animal to show that they are truly enslaved. And I was wondering if I was one of those people who was being led away in chains that I would start to think this isn't fair. I mean, I just left my house and all my stuff and they just took it. And now I'm... I've got the clothes on my back. I'm in chains. I don't know where I'm going or what I'm going to do. And how can this be fair, God, that you're going to do this to me? That I deserve this? Was it unjust for God to take Judah into captivity? No, it was not. It was the appropriate punishment God had decided. It was perfectly just. And he told them it was coming. He promised them if they didn't repent, that was going to happen. It was completely within line of that. But I bet it felt unjust. And I bet it felt especially unjust when the Babylonians sneered and mocked and mistreated and used them inappropriately. If you've ever been mishandled by someone, you know exactly what I mean. That hurts. And part of you is, well, depends how you roll. Part of you may just collapse and crumble underneath that thing. And part of you ready to go to war, right? I'd rather die than do this, right? It evokes a lot of this. God was just in sending them away. But God was going to leave, he was not going to leave Babylon unpunished in this. 
He wasn't going to punish them for taking their mess captives. He was going to punish them for very specific sins that he was holding them accountable for. But God had not forgotten his people. And God, and this is what I want to walk away with today. God doesn't forget his children, and he doesn't forget what's right and wrong ever. Even though it doesn't get satisfied today or tomorrow, and my friend who killed that guy, he's going to have a punishment, or somebody's going to pay for that someday. It'll all get sorted out someday, and that's where I want to get, that if you've been treated unjustly, if there is things in your life that just have never been fair, and it won't be fair It will get sorted out. God is faithful to do what is right every time. Jeremiah 15, the word that the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, concerning the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare among the nations and proclaim, set up a banner and proclaim, conceal it not. Say, Babylon is taken, Bel is put to shame, Merodach is dismayed, and her image is are put to shame, her idols are dismayed. For out of the north a nation has come up against her, which will make her a land a desolation, and none shall dwell in it, both man and beast will flee away. And in those days, in that time, declares the Lord, the people of Israel and the people of Judah shall come together weeping as they come, and they shall seek the Lord their God, and they shall ask the way to Zion with faces turned toward it, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant That will never be forgotten. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away on the mountains. From mountain to hill they have gone. They have forgotten their fold, and all who found them have devoured them. And their enemies have said, we're not guilty, for they have sinned against the Lord. And their habitation of the righteousness, the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Go out of the land of the Chaldeans. Be as male goats before the flock. For behold, I am stirring up and bringing against Babylon a gathering of great nations from the north country. And they shall array themselves against her, and from there she shall be taken. And their arrows are like a skilled warrior who does not return empty-handed. Chaldea shall be plundered, and all who plunder her shall be sated, declares the Lord. Though you rejoice, though you exalt, O plunderers of my heritage, and though you frolic like a heifer in a pasture and like neigh like stallions, Your mother shall be utterly ashamed, and she who bore you shall be disgraced. Behold, she shall be the last of nations, a wilderness, a dry land, a desert, because of the wrath of the Lord. She shall not be inhabited, but she shall be utter desolation. And it goes on and on and on. And God is saying, hey, you're going to get it, O nation Babylon, who thought you're so great. You're going to get it. And... He goes, and I'm going to jump down just bits and pieces. I want you to see why he's doing it. He's not doing it because they followed his instruction to take his people. He's taken them away because they have overstepped the bounds of that punishment. Verse 17, Israel is is a hunted sheep driven away by lions, for the king of Assyria devoured them. And now now at last Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has gnawed his bones. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I am bringing punishment on the king of Babylon and his land. And as I punish the king of Assyria, I will restore Israel to its pasture. He shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and he shall desire, his desire shall be satisfied on the hills of Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and that time, declares the Lord, iniquity shall be sought in Israel, and there shall be none. And sin in Judah, and it shall not be found. And for I will pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. He's saying, I gave you to Assyria, and I gave you to Babylon, and they overstepped it. They devoured you. They chewed you up and spit you out. But I'll bring you back. And people are going to look for sin among the people of God and not find it in that day. There's going to be a restoration of the souls of the people. It's the new covenant all over again. We're going to get to in a few weeks, Jeremiah 31, where God's going to restore his people in a fullness, in a change of heart, when they will uh, be changed inside. And then he goes later, mocking Babylon, how the hammer of the whole earth is cut down and broken, how Babylon has become a horror among the nations. I set, sna- I set a snare for you, and you were taken, O Babylon. You did not know it. You were found and caught because you opposed 
the Lord. Oh, God doesn't allow opposition. Do you, do you think, and I thought this is quite interesting. Do you think God is going to allow people to oppose him and walk away? Get away from it completely? No. Where did that idea come from? That the people in our world and the people of that world could somehow mock the God of the universe, mistreat his people, and then get away scot-free? Huh. No, 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 no. You got caught, he said. You thought you could get away with it. No, you don't get to do that without God eventually exacting justice. I want you to roll over to Daniel chapter 4. We get a really kind of a microcosmic picture of what's going on exactly here. I'll read a bit of it, but I'm mostly just going to tell the story. <clears throat> in, 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 in the chapter 4 of Daniel, um, Daniel is with the first group. And they went to Babylon as captives, okay? And Nebuchadnezzar is this great king, and God is using him, and he's doing what God wants, but he thinks he's pretty good stuff, Right? And, he, and as he's going on, he thinks he's great, um, and he's honoring God in some ways. It, it seemed, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, king of all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live on the earth. May your peace abound. And he's, he's top dog. It seems good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God had done for me. So he's acknowledging and extolling the God of the universe. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Don't expect that from the mouth of a pagan king, right? We just don't expect that, right? But he's, he's saying that. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house, flourishing in my palace. He's living good. And he sees a dream. And it made me fearful in these fantasies as I laid on my bed. And the visions of my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon that they may make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Long and short, nobody could do it. So he finally brings Daniel in and he tells the dream to Daniel. And this is what the dream. He says, I dreamed there was a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. Verse 11, the tree grew large and became strong and its height reached the sky and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and fruit was abundant. It was food for all. And the beasts of the field found shade under it. And the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. And all living creatures fed themselves from it. And I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. And behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. And shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree and cut off its branches and strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from the branches and yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground but put a band of iron and bronze around it. And in the new grass of the field let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a beast, that of a man and let the beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. And Daniel hears it, understands it. And he says, oh, king, I wish this was for your enemies. I wish this on anybody but you. I don't want this to happen. And he says, this is the thing. If you do not continue to honor and respect the God of the universe, if you raise yourself up with pride, this is you. You're going to be cut off. You're going to go from the mind of a human to a mind of, an, of a beast and madness, and you're going to go out in the fields. And about a year later, he's up on his patio looking out over his kingdom thinking, hmm, I'm pretty special. Look what I've done. I've made this giant, giant kingdom of my own. Aren't I wonderful? And at that same moment, he hears a voice saying, you did it. And his mind left him. And he went out into the field for seven years and he ate grass like an animal. His hair grew long, his nails were like the nails or talons of birds. Completely feral human being. Until he came to his senses and recognized God. 
The story is like a microcosm of what God was expecting of Babylon. To do what God had intended, to recognize God for who he was, and when they didn't, punishment would be exacted. It's exactly what he was intending. Later in Jeremiah 50, he talks about the Chaldeans were being full of guilt. Babylon has fallen. This is in chapter 51. Wail for her. Interesting, he makes a statement. Take balm for her pain, speaking of Babylon. Perhaps she may be healed. Verse 8. Verse 9. We would have healed Babylon, but she would not be healed. Would not heal. Forsake her. Get away from her. Get out of there. Verse 11, sharpen the arrows, take up the shield. She wouldn't be healed. She wouldn't repent. The Lord has stirred up the spirit of the Medes concerning Babylon to destroy it. And vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for his temple. God doesn't forget his people. He will never forget his people. Does he chastise his people at times? Yes. But God is a God of justice. And this is what I think what I really want to come down to uh, there's the whole all of 51, and I'm going to move right on past it. Babylon gets it. Babylon gets it. The gods of Babylon, they get it. Everybody in Babylon is going to get it because they have rejected God. They mistreated his people. And then I started to come down to this other idea. When do we get Justice. When do you get justice for the injustice of life? Has God forgotten you? Has God forgotten all the things that have gone on in your world? There's some people here that have been wronged in ways that we'll never know, will never be publicly stated. You've been handled in ways that has changed the course and trajectory of your life forever. And it can't be repaired. Not in this life. There are people in this room that are carrying those kind of things around. Injustice seems like it will never happen in this world. And we are left wondering why do we even exist if that's the pain we live in. How do you live in that? How do we as Christians live in that? How do people who go to Babylon live in the fact that they lost everything? Many of them had lost family members. How do you live in that and still honor God and understand what God is? And I, and I think the difficulty is you got to start with one thing for me. I'm easily, no, I shouldn't say I'm easily offended, but I, I get offended. You take my sword, I'm offended, right? You, 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 you know, I, you can say things about me. That, that doesn't harm me a lot. But when does it get made right? When do things get made right with you? And I had to decide this. I don't know what justice is. I confess that. What I would say, that looks unjust to me, doesn't necessarily mean it's unjust. There was a time when one of the grandkids was in the hospital, children's hospital. And it, and it dawned on me that single day, on a single day at the hospital, that it, there's 10 floors of children in hospital beds. Uh, how, how, how can that be fair? I mean, in the sense of that doesn't seem just at all, right? Why do some children get health, others don't? I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. I don't understand that. And it's, it's beyond my capacity. I, I, and I would say this on beyond your capacity. Well, if I don't understand what's just and unjust or fair or unfair, who does? Who gets to decide what's fair and unfair, what's just and what needs done? And I'm, if you can come to the conclusion, and this is what I found, it would help me. In, in the Old Testament, this, this term righteousness and justice in many cases are interchangeable. That God in his righteousness 
gets justice. He gets what's right and wrong in every circumstance. We discussed Job this morning in Sunday school a little bit about he lost his children in a single day, all, all ten of them. He lost all of his wealth, and he just got swept away. And God was in part behind it. God allowed it to happen intentionally. He, he made the deal with Satan that this could happen. Was it unjust? Well, it seemed really unjust. But God gets it. God has a plan that's greater than we do. And this is what I found. This is awkward. I'm sure it felt unjust going off into Babylon. But it wasn't. And, and here's just a side note as I wrote to myself here. I thought this was that God uses governments. And governments almost always are unjust in some capacity. They must always favor some over others. Is that unjust? Well, it seems like it is, but is it? I mean, we favor our families over others, don't we? Of course. Does it make it unjust? Well, I don't know. I don't even know for sure. I do know that God uses governments. He used Babylon. But I also know that God holds governments responsible. Interesting how that works. That, would, that should terrorize anybody who wants to be in government. When you go into government and you don't get it right, God's watching and he's going to make sure that you pay for that. And then it landed on this one here. If you would in, uh, allow me, I'm going to go to the revelation because this kind of helps me when it all comes down to it. In the revelation... Chapter 6. It's the beginning of the tribulation. And in the beginning of the tribulation, there's this idea um, that this, this really horrifying stuff is being poured out on the earth. Okay, you've got the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You've got uh, all these things. You've got death and pestilence and all of this. And then in verse 9 of chapter 6 of the Revelation you see something that's going on, and it says, And he broke the fifth seal. And I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony that they had maintained. They'd been martyred for their faith. They'd stood up for their faith, and it cost them their very lives. And that was wrong. And they cried out, which is a little bit of a window into heaven, folks. This isn't the eternal kingdom here. They are in heaven. They're up in the presence of the Lord. But all the tears aren't gone yet until the end. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They've just been martyred. They're in the presence of the Lord. And they're saying in a loud voice, Hey! How long until they get it for our blood? They wanted justice. They wanted vengeance. They want that be. Is that a legitimate request? In verse 11, and each of them were given a white robe. And they were told that they should wet rest for a little while until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been should be completed also. It's like, hey, put on a robe, take a little rest, wait a little while because there's more of them are going to be killed and then we're going to see what happens. That doesn't usually satisfy, just wait. Are you happy to wait for justice? Are you happy to wait for that? That's what they're told. Just wait a little bit. But as the revelation starts to unravel itself and things are coming apart, go over to chapter 16. Things are getting really bad. You're in the bowls of wrath and, and the tribulation is ramping higher and higher. And as it ramps up, chapter 16, uh, 
And I heard a loud voice from the temple, this is in the heavenly, saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God on earth. And the first angel went and poured his, out his bowl on the earth, and it became loathsome and malignant sore upon the men who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his bowl in the rivers and the springs of the water, and they became blood. It's getting really ugly, but there's rationale behind this, okay? Listen to what he says. And I heard the angel of the water say, Righteous or just are thou who art and who wast, O holy one, because thou didst judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. They deserve it. God didn't forget. God didn't forget his children, and he won't forget you. There will be justice. There will be payment. There, this doesn't go unnoticed and unmarked by God. There is punishment for those who reject him. There is punishment for Babylon, for even though they had been given the very opportunity, then they re rejected it. And God pulled the stops out on them. Listen, folks. Listen carefully. We live in a world where everything we want to be nice. And we want happiness and joy to all. But you realize that those who reject the God of the universe, those who reject his son, those who mistreat his people are not off the hook. Just because you don't see it maybe in this life. If you would go a bit further, you can get into the Revelation 20. And it talks about a great white throne. And at the great white throne, the dead are raised. And they come and stand before a just and holy God. And all whose names are not written in the book of life. Justice is exacted in the lake of fire. Why would he tell us this stuff? I'll tell you why. We got a God who's serious about us, about himself, about holiness. He's serious about his son Jesus. He didn't send him to die for nothing. And he didn't send him to die to be mocked. And he doesn't take it light. And he won't take it light. Why do you think we send missionaries around the world? Because it's important. Justice of God matters. I know I've bounced around a bit today. And I'm still kind of trying to put all this justice stuff together in my head. But this one is where I want to finally leave you. Since we're kind of bouncing around, just turn left a little bit to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. And this one kind of helped me. 1 Peter chapter 4. It kind of helped me because it kind of just gave me instructions. And I think it will give you instructions as well. Very simple because I think Peter was a simple guy. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to test you as something strange was happening to you. Oh. He didn't say if it comes, right? Don't be surprised when it comes. It's coming. As, don't be surprised as something strange has happened to you. Why should this happen to me? That's kind of the question, right? But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time if for excuse me, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Saying if God judges his people, and if Jeremiah has taught us anything, he does. He demands their holiness. And if it starts with those, what's going to happen to those who don't obey the gospel? Great question. And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Another great question. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will, and this is what it is, entrust their souls to a faithful creator. That's where we get to land. When the fiery trial comes, what do you do? Really? Who do you entrust yourself to? God, I wanted to go get that guy and take my sword and bust him in the mouth for being a knucklehead, right? That seemed fair. But I was kind of cowardly at that time. I didn't want to take a chance. God, I'm going to trust you to Bust him in the mouth for me. Do you trust God with the entirety of your life? Can you trust God? And, I, and you have to say, can you entrust your soul, the very, the very heart of you? Can you entrust your very soul to the faithful creator of all this universe? I hope so. That's what he says. When a trial comes, trust God. Just trust God with your life, your soul. Let him handle it. God, I trust you with my soul. It's not fair. It doesn't feel fair. I, and I don't even know what to do with it. But I trust you with my soul. Can you do that? Because that's the first step. And trusting your soul to God. And you, that starts with knowing Jesus as Savior. We've been over that. If you don't know Jesus as Savior, come see me. You, you can't get from here to there without it. But Christian, entrust your soul to a faithful creator. Then he finishes up with this. While doing good. Oh. Oh. You see, you don't get to be crippled by the trial. It hurts. There's no solution. God's going to get him in the end, and I trust that part. But I'm just going to be mad forever. And I'm just going to sit here and wait for God to uh, give it to him. And then I'm going to applaud. No, no. You don't get that luxury. While doing good. You don't get to stop being what you were designed to be. Yes, you're wounded. Yes, you're scarred. Yes, you're hobbling through life with trauma and baggage and horror. Can you do good for someone? For God? For your neighbor? That's how you handle it. That's how I handle it. God, you're going to have to get this. I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let you take care of vengeance, justice, all of that. I'm just going to give it to you. And I'm going to look around and see who I can do good for. That's how you handle it. God is a God of justice. He will take care of each of us in his time appropriately. And we can count on that. And meanwhile, entrust your souls to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this interesting passage of Jeremiah as we consider the fact that you and your righteousness would judge the nation that would take your people into captivity. And that you would judge them in righteousness and you would judge them according to uh, your standard. 
Lord, we, we trust your judgment to be just. Uh, Lord, we confess that oftentimes we're confused uh, by the nature of the speed of judgment. Sometimes it seems like we'd like to see it in this life, and it doesn't happen. Lord, in the meanwhile, I pray that you would help us to look to you, to entrust our souls to you, to understand that uh, you have it in your hands, you have it in control, and you eventually will work it out according to you and according to your plan. Lord, I pray in the meanwhile that as we entrust our souls to you, that we would do good, that we would do good because you are good, and that you are in us and that you are leading us to that. Help us not to miss that mark, that we would glorify you in this life with sufferings and all, that in the end, uh, you would be fully glorified in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Thanks, Nick, for the challenge to continue to trust the Lord. Um, Jesus set the example. We read that earlier in 1 Peter there in chapter 2. I'd love it if you'd stand with me. Um, I don't know about you, but I find it easier to trust people I think are faithful. How much more our faithful, faithful God.
As we continue on with the balance of our service, we're obviously doing something different, um, as you can see behind me. Um, we have a baptism today, but just I want to read a succinct statement about baptism. Uh, water baptism is intended for every person who has received the saving benefits of Christ through the new birth of the Holy Spirit. In obedience to Christ's command as a testimony to God, the church, and oneself, the world, believers are baptized by water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Water baptism is a visual and symbolic demonstration of a person's union with Christ in the likeness of his death and resurrection. It signifies that a former way of life has been put to death and vividly depicts the release from the dominion of Satan, sin, and death. It is a symbol that we're going to do today. So I'm going to hand it over to David and Levi. Hello, my name is Leah Shadle. I am 13 years old. I grew up in this church. I did all the kids programs in VBS. It was the best thing ever growing up. I grew up knowing Jesus. I asked Jesus into my life on October 14, 2018. But when I was little, my brother and sister got baptized. I didn't really understand what it meant, but now I understand. I'm being baptized because we do not deserve Jesus, but he sacrificed himself anyway. We all have sinned, and Jesus died for us to take it away. I believe and trust in him. Today I show my faith to all of you by being baptized. I want to learn more about him and to grow with Christ by my side. To let people know that God, what God has done for me and that he loves me, and to show others that he loves them, especially the people that don't know that. Baptism will not save me, but it tells all of you my love for Jesus. I encourage you to know and to trust Jesus, and I would like to thank my parents and my siblings and friends for helping me on this journey with Christ, and thank you for being such a good church. All right, Leah, on your profession of faith, I am so excited to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As they tow her down, I would like to invite our deacons. She's supposed to stay right there. Our deacons and those who are going to be brought into membership today to please come forward to the platform. Come on. Come on up. Right next front, right up along there. Well, I was going to try to hide behind the lectern, but I guess I'm not. <laughs> All right. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming into our church family the following individuals. Cassie Turner, Karen Busey, Russ Busey, Josh Blount, Tim Gallant, Leah Shadel, and Katie Stewart. We believe that membership is a formal and intentional expression of our, our commitment and partnership to the other members of the local assembly. 
It indicates that we are willing to help each other and build each other up according to the word of God. The Constitution of Ebenezer Mennonite Church states the following. Eligibility for membership in this congregation is based on the following confession of faith in Christ, a willingness to, to follow the Lord in baptism, evidence of Christian character, acceptance of the rights and responsibilities expressed in this Constitution, and affirmation of the statement of faith. Prospective members will attend the church membership class and will be interviewed by the deacons, which they have been. Upon their approval, the deacons will present the candidates to the congregation who, by standing, will confirm the, con the candidate's membership. The duties of membership, or members and partners, is to lead a faithful Christian life, exercise Christian love toward everyone, attend faithfully regular congregational services and meetings, and have daily personal devotions. Members will, leave, will, live, excuse me, will live exemplary lives of service unto Christ. A Christian should gratefully and obediently respond to God's redeeming love by using his resources for the fulfillment of Christ's mission in the world. Such stewardship requires the Christian to give freely and systematically of his time, talents, and possessions. Parents will diligently train their children and as a family faithfully attend the regular services of the church. These individuals have been interviewed by the deacons and are approved for membership. So now I have to ask the new members, are you willing to commit to Ebenezer Mennonite Church and endeavor to build up and encourage other members as described in the word and reiterated in our constitution if so, please answer, I am. All right, great. All right, now, if the congregation would stand, please. Okay, so you're all standing to affirm that you will support these folks as members of the congregation. All right. And I've asked Pastor David if he would close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this exciting day. Lord, thank you for for the baptism service, and thank you for these members, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as a church, we will love them, encourage them, hold them accountable to the faith they have in you, Father. Lord, thank you for their willingness to, to be all in at Ebenezer. And Lord, we realize that this is your church and not ours. So Lord, we ask where we can serve together. Help us to serve and always point people to who you are. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.